How do you all fit in Bliss House? <laughs> Which, actually, I know that you're, you don't, because this wing over here isn't in Bliss House. When I first looked at everybody, that was my first question. I thought, how do we all fit in, in Bliss House? So, um, what I'm essentially going to do today is talk um, uh, about um, the kinds of things I talked with the senior ad, um, leadership team in academic affairs during our reset training, to so talk a little bit about the vision for where we're going and kind of share with you some of the things that we've been talking about. Some of these slides won't pertain, so we'll, we'll flip through them. Um, and I'll try to kind of tailor this a little bit to you. And so I'll give you a little bit of the vision for sort of how I, I see academic affairs being organized and kind of where we're going. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit. Um, does that sound good? Yeah. Good. So, uh, Go ahead. <laughs> so we've been calling these reset meetings, and the reason we've been calling it reset is that since there's been a lot of reorganization already and the changes were in process when I came, um, at times I would find myself um, coming to the office and talking to some of the deans and saying, so what's the policy on this? And someone would say, well, I don't know. And someone would say, it's this. And someone would say, it's that. And someone would say, we don't have one. And someone would say, we're rewriting it. And I realized, whoa, <laughs> I think these re reorganizations are in a, a number of places simultaneously. So we need to just hit restart, hit reset, and go back to the overall vision and scope of what we're doing, and then go back through our policies and procedures and make sure they still make sense. Or if they're conflicting, that we work that out. And that's what we're in process of doing. And we'll probably will be for the next year. Um, we haven't solved everything, but I think at least we know where the issues lie. So we've been calling it reset. Um, these are the five principles that Adam has been raising with the senior team. And I thought they're really good to bring to all of you, to all of our managers and coordinators and, and, uh, and our whole team. These are the principles that we as the vice presidents, and I've asked the deans, use as going forward. Um, we like principles better than saying, you know, a strategic framework that by Tuesday everything has to happen because one of the things we learn about in foreign, as a foreign language teacher is that you don't learn how to use verbs by learning all the rules. You learn to use verbs by learning the big principles. And the people who are more successful foreign language learners don't try to memorize a hundred rules. Big surprise. So if you've been trying to learn German or Japanese or Chinese, stop trying to learn all the rules. You'll never learn them. They're too complicated. But if you step back to higher principles, to bigger principles, it becomes easier to operate. So we want to go with big principles that everybody can get their head around. One of them is leverage existing assets, which means that we all know we have to do more with less. So if it's possible to share resources, we need to share resources. If it's possible to work with another unit across campus rather than bringing in a new resource outside, we, sh we should be trying to do that more and more. Um, manage expense increases. We are budget conscious. You know, we are a mission-driven organization. We are going to fulfill our academic mission, but we have to be careful about our resources. So all of us, from the senior leadership to the, the, the managers, at every level need to be aware of that. No matter what you, who you are or what your role is in the organization, you can help us leverage our existing assets and manage our expense increases by being mindful of what you really need um, and, and what's going to be most effective. That doesn't mean that we don't spend money when we need to, that we not, don't have a nice lunch and bring everyone together because it's important for us to build teamwork. Um, but it means we need to identify what are those things that we really need to do and invest in those. Um, and I think you'll see that even though we're managing expense increases, we are also investing. We're really repurposing our resources to you, to helping to organize so that you're, you all have clearer jobs, clearer roles and responsibilities, comfortable places to work, um, a nice campus. Uh, so even as we're managing our expense increases, we are actually investing. El Cafe, the, um, the Career Center, repainting and recarpeting in bliss. Those are all examples of things that we're doing. But we're also managing those costs to make sure that we're being effective wherever we can. And I've asked the deans to go through and cut extra money out of their budget that they don't need. And curiously enough, we found we were able to do that and still make these investments because we're being more careful. Um, the third one is that we do have to generate revenue. Even though we're not a for-profit organization, every one of our big business units needs to be generating revenue. That doesn't mean that every single program in study abroad, every single semester, has to generate revenue or it's gone, but study abroad as a whole, and the regions as a whole, need to be generating revenue. And the same thing for EIL, and the same thing for study abroad. We need to be working towards that, okay? And so that's something we've been looking at. Demanding quality is, is number one. We, 
absolutely have to always be focused on quality. Our quality in our student and our interactions with our students, our quality of our academic program, the quality of our interactions with each other. It's how we live and, and that's who we are as SIT. Um, we are always going to demand quality and hold ourselves accountable and each other to really high standards. Um, the Promote World Learning, you know, is I again, these are written originally for us, but all of us in this room can do this. Talk about the positive things of the organization. Always, when you're meeting other people, what do you do? Who do you work for? Be proud of World Learning. Talk about, about what we do in our programs. Um, who knows what kind of partners, future students, future parents, we might be interacting with on a daily basis just at Hannaford's or at the airport or wherever we happen to be in our daily lives. Okay, we'll just go back one more. I think we got one more. Go back. Just go, yeah, go back. Just, yeah, see if you can go backwards. So if you see all of these things, I wanted to just say that they all, that they all interact. He's got them, you know, Adam created this as a circle because really what we're trying to say with this is that they're all important and there's not one of them that's more important than the other and that really they're, they're all together important. So if we keep these principles in mind as we, as we move forward and as we build our team and build our, um, our academic organization, I think these, these things will be what guide us and inform us. Okay, gotcha. Um, so this, this mess is, I, rather than put an org chart up, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit what my function is as provost and how the different units work together. And it isn't a clear you know, hierarchy like an org chart. That's not always helpful. What this suggests is that we have three really um, separate business units, right? And we have some deans that work in our different units, our academic units, and we have some deans that cross lines. So here in the provost's office, decisions get made, finances get allocated, right? It's kind of the central hub. And you have some deans, a dean of assessment and academic administration, so Ellen, you have the Dean of Strategic Enrollment Management. A lot of you work with Lori's team. And you have a Dean of Students. A lot of you work with Michael. These deans work for all of the academic units. Okay, we don't have separate, and we shouldn't have, we're working towards having all of our evaluation in Ellen's shop. Organizing it, coordinating it, and getting it back out to all of you to use. Lori is, is responsible for strategic enrollment management at all of the units, right? So EIL now fully, and, um, and study abroad and grad are all there together, right? Working, um, you know, and a kind of common vision for how we enroll students and how we um, get them in and, and our institutional relations too. Uh, and the Dean of Students is Dean of Students for all of our students. And when you think about it, that fits our principles. It's leveraging our existing assets. We don't need three Dean of Students offices. And there was a time in this organization when we kind of had that, you know, when, when basically the campus was really separate from what was going on in the other units. So that helps us to be more effective and more efficient to collaborate more, um, to manage our expenses better. Um, and so these three deans have a kind of a unique role. Um, they get to come to all the meetings that I have because they're involved with all the different academic units. Um, and then we have different academic units that are organized. We have the experiment with its directors, support staff, its partners and leaders. We have, um, will have, it's a position open now we're hiring for, an assistant provost, someone in the center of study abroad, helping me to coordinate all of the study abroad activities, which include the academic um, deans that we have, the dean for custom and comparative, and all of their staff, and all of their teams, right? Um, there would be more bubbles in, up here than you could shake a stick at if I put all of the bubbles on, but this gives you a sense of the team. So the program coordinators that are here, the managers of administration and so on that are all part of study abroad. And the Graduate Institute, which has its dean. Another position that's currently open is Preeti moves more to Washington, so we will have a dean here uh, based full-time in, in Vermont um, with their degree chairs, their administrative support, and, and their staff, right? So that's kind of the vision, is that I'll be bringing everything to a central point in the middle somehow, coordinating as a clearinghouse for information and, and ideas, but each one of the different academic units will be working, you know, as a satellite on its own with its own framework and strategy and its deans that will help manage it and each one of you, you know, fit into those teams. And some of you, of course, are more closely linked here in the center because you have responsibilities that spread out across the whole organization. Does that kind of help you see? Um, 
It also helps to explain that, that not all deans are the same. You know, some deans are really responsible for managing a, a, a group of people, and some deans are, gr are managing policies that, uh, that apply to all of us. So really, Ellen, Lori, and Michael are different than Tina, Saeed, uh, and Lauren. Not in their value to the team or what they contribute, but in, in their role. And I think by sometimes when you say the deans, you know, you don't realize that there are some really different responsibilities, that some of them are really sweeping. They have, they have responsibility for the overall management of the whole organization. In management theory, you would call those your staff managers, and you would call um, the, the deans your line managers, right? It comes from the idea of production line. Our production line is we build ideas and we build academic programs, right? And so our production lines are our, our study abroad, EIL, and the Grad Institute. They're the factories, the powerhouses of, of the knowledge that we're creating, right? And then we have staff managers like here at the organization. We also have HR that responds to everyone, right? With our, in our own unit, we have those staff managers too. So that's kind of a bit about the organization. Any questions on how that works? Um, how it's a little different than a typical org chart you might normally see. Okay, good. So, I think this is one of the big things we want to get rid of. <coughs> when I when I pulled away the org chart and I and I got rid of the um, the the hierarchies and there are hierarchies. I report to Adam and and Michael reports to me and his staff report to me. That exists. But, and we have to have that in order to have accountability down and up the line. But what we want to avoid is this. Because it really isn't about which is more important, study abroad, EIL, the Grad Institute. What's more important, enrollment or assessment? It's all important. And I, my expectation is for people to work together um, and for us to try to break down this you know, us and them mentality. It's endemic in academic organizations. It's tough to break down. It's hard work. Um, but we have to do that by coming together like this. And you don't need me. That's the, the good thing to know. You can do this on your own. Challenge yourselves to go have lunch with somebody in another unit that you haven't spent time with. To go to an SIT event and sit at a table that you don't normally sit at with people that aren't at your unit. Because typically when I go down to the community meetings, you know, I can tell the work groups are fairly intact. You know, you don't, you don't mix. If you think about what we teach in the Grad Institute, right, about crossing cultures, I'll stand up here and watch and the African students are there and the Latin American, and we're <laughs> an organization that teaches intercultural. But it's tough. You know, the founder of, of kind of some of our intercultural communication theory, Edward T. Hall, talks, his book was Beyond Culture. Our culture can also limit us as well as you know, inform us and be an enriching experience. We, we get stuck in our culture, so we have to get beyond it. And the same is true of organizations as it is of regional or social or ethnic cultures. We have to sometimes get beyond that. The culture of admissions, the culture of, of, of um, student affairs, the culture of study abroad, the culture of the Africa programs team, you know, all of those little mini cultures that we have and kind of try to break out of those. So that's a, an idea we're trying to foster. Among the deans, the way that looks is that Deans have their regional focus, but when we get together, sometimes I challenge them and say, um, think for a minute about our critical global issues in the whole portfolio. Where do we need to have more programs? And maybe it's Tina in Africa who says, you know, we really need another health program in Latin America, right? Because it isn't about Tina gets more points because she has more programs. It's about everyone gets more points and we have the right programs for the students that we need to serve across the region. So that's kind of how I work with my team to break down the us and them mentality, to bring them together. It's more transparency. So when deans go on a trip, Tina right now, as some of you know, is, at, is out in the field um, visiting some of her programs. When she comes back, she's going to present to the entire senior study board. What did she do? What did she learn? What are her goals for the future? So that everybody knows what Tina's up to. Lori will be presenting the marketing plan to all of the other deans so that they know what the strategic priorities are for enrollment management um, that, that Lori and Shauna and her team have been working on are so that all of us can be helpful and useful in promoting that. So breaking down barriers, creating more avenues for collaboration, creating spaces for collaboration is, is the real, I think, priority. Um, and you'll see that that's, that's kind of informed um, organizing more meetings, trying to bring people together, doing reset trainings, and if you have ideas on how to do this, we're open. We're happy to hear them. Uh, next. So this is what we want to see more, right? <laughs> people working together, right? So. 
So the vision is the provost's office is a centralized decision-making body, right? Kind of the, the hub, right? Spoken wheels. And the deans and our directors of EIL are responsible for the success of their unit, of course, and, but providing strategic input into the entire academic mission of the whole organization. So wherever you sit, whatever team you're in, your dean, your leader, your input up through those leaders helps impact the entire organization. We want to think regionally because we have in study abroad particularly regional focus or in the grad school we have programmatic focus but we also want to think globally and try to all have ownership in the implementation of the entire world learning policy and our, and our mission. So that's kind of where we go. Um, we can keep going. That's some detailed stuff. This I think, go back to that one one more. Um, some of you, ha how many of you heard the idea of academic governance? Do you know that? What does it mean? in your vision? They set the agenda for the curriculum. They set the agenda for the curriculum. Other ideas? Ensuring quality. Ensuring quality. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Having faculty voice in policies and procedures. Yes, faculty voice in policy and procedures. We're different than um, some organizations, right? We're not exactly like all colleges and universities, but we're not like all study abroad organizations by being accredited. Um, the whole accreditation um, system came about as a way to ensure that, that organizations that are giving degrees and receiving federal money for those degrees are adhering to common standards, right? And back in the day, you'd be surprised, but there was a time when university faculty, we sometimes think the faculty, you know, are this kind of shrouded in mis mystery and they have their PhDs and they're revered. There was a time in this day when faculty were no more professional than um, a carpenter or a barber shop. They were considered crafts. And they didn't have a lot of voice in the administration of, the organ uh, of a university. And um, consequently, if they had a belief that maybe the administration didn't like, and they were teaching in their field and advocating for a particular point of view that the administration, they would just get fired. So the idea was to protect the academic integrity of the institution, to allow faculty to be free thinking. Right? And if you think of the liberal arts, liberal doesn't mean liberal like liberal versus conservative, it means liber liberal like liberty, as in freedom. The arts that make free people, right? That's the liberal arts. And you wanted to guarantee the liberal arts could thrive by creating <coughs> faculty that were independent and that could have input into decision making. Um, there's sometimes a, a question about what's the difference between an academic governance policy and an administrative policy and, and there are always going to be some, some tensions there. Um, primarily the Board of Trustees sets our administrative, overall administrative agenda, our budgets, what we can and can't do, the bigger limits, and they delegate their authority to Adam and his officers, to the pre vice presidents, right, for making decisions about where we're going, you know, how fast we're going to get there, and how we're going to use our resources. But the academics, as Eric said, are designed to be in, in, have a voice in the room, and that includes the students through SITSA, which is part of the governance body, right, to provide voice and vision on our academics and where we're going. And we're unique. We're not like the other study abroad providers or high school providers in that we are accredited. And so, and that acc accreditation informs kind of all of what we do, not just the Graduate Institute. It also informs study abroad. So um, I, I like to talk a little bit about academic governance and, and, and what its purpose is. Um, yeah. One area where it's gotten confused recently and um, is that we haven't had a program development committee for a while and so what happens is academic affairs has taken it all on. They've had to deal with everything from, you know, legally should we be operating in this country? Is this the right risk reward, um, you know, uh, equation? Are our students going to be safe? Um, you know, is this where we want to be financially as well as academically? Because there hasn't been one. So we've really um, set out that the deans the senior team of deans uh, will meet together and look at the strategic merits of programs, the financial viability, market, external conditions, right? We'll look at those things and the Academic Affairs Committee will do what its job is, which is look at the academic merits of a specific program course or curricular innovation, right? Within the framework of our overall mission. So we've really kind of tried to clarify duties a little bit so that we can work more effectively together. Before we had sort of a mix where sometimes the deans were doing the same work as the academic affairs and so I've kind of tried to clarify that a little bit. I, I know who sits on the Academic Affairs Committee, but who sits on the Program Development Committee? So Program Development Committee are all the deans or all the deans. So Lori, Michael, 
Tina, Lauren, Saeed, you know, all of them, whether they're staff, you know, and they, and they staff managers that work with everyone or line managers that work with one, within one unit. It's all of the deans. Um, and occasionally we bring people in. Yeah, the syllabi revisions and things always go through academic affairs, right? They're always the ones that are going to be looking at that. And what we did was take the program development stuff out a little bit to make more space for them because part of the challenge is that it takes forever to get things through academic affairs, right? And I think all of you who work in study abroad particularly because there's so much curriculum innovation going on in study abroad, it slows things down. Which is a, a good point, and that's where a number of you in this room can help. And uh, as I know, some of you are program coordinators and work with the dean's teams. Um, that's part of the demanding quality, right? If we start at the very beginning with the syllabus when it first gets created, and, and if you're helping to to provide input to a, to an academic dean on it, um, raise questions if you see an issue, if there are misspellings, if there are typos, if you if you catch something uh, along the line, so that as it moves up, it, it's better. It's you know the quality is there and so we take our time because sometimes we've rushed things through academic affairs and then you're right they get Helen's right they get, they get it and it's full of, of, of mistakes because it's just not ready so I'm trying to also slow things down a little bit and take our time I don't think there's any rush in developing we're in a slow part of the market now where it's tough as you know those of you particularly who are out in recruiting and, and, and enrollment management area know that it's a tough market um, the challenge of that is it's a tough market and we have to figure out how to grow the opportunity of that is we get to slow down, take more time on our syllabi, take more time on our curricular revisions, think through them, be more strategic. Um, and actually that's not a bad place to be for a while, to be honest. It's kind of maybe more exciting to be in that fast pace where everything's flying. Um, but actually this is a time, the time when things are slower that gives us an opportunity to deliberate and think and be more strategic, right? Um, so I talk a little bit about how do we make these decisions and if you keep going you'll see these little balls popping in here, right? So kind of the process is that we bef- can bounce all the balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can bounce them up in a can you, can you juggle them? Yeah. Um, I try to make a decision that's based on all of that. I try to factor in there what the program development committee says about things operationally, what the academic affairs recommends, and other stakeholders. We may need to bring finance in. We need to, we need to bring in um, a, uh, um, legal affairs at times. We need to bring in. So other stakeholders in the, within the organization. And at times working with um, IDEP, frankly. You know, they, they sometimes, I, I need their vision or their voice. Um, if we're opening a program in Egypt and they have contracts in Egypt, I need to know how our academic program in study abroad might work or, or complement or overlap with what they're doing in Egypt. So we bring all those things together in deciding on programs and curricula. I, if I can make a comment too, I mean, I, I think we've all experienced some challenges sometimes with not being clear about when a new program is approved or what it means. and. You know, people are out developing programs when there's actually no budget and, and that sort of thing. So what this does is the program development, the Academic Affairs Committee will not look at anything until the Program Development Committee has given it a green light. And I think that will clear up a lot of these misconceptions yeah. about things out there. Some people think it's starting. You know, mm-hmm. I hear people say, like, oh, it's ready for the web, but it hasn't actually been approved. So, I mean, this... This, this will help. Yeah. And that idea of, of being efficient. We all have a million things to do, and it's not worth working on new programs mm-hmm. that are never going to get approved. So yeah, yeah. It's important. Sure. Yeah. It would be interesting to hear your thoughts on how, um, in that program development committee, you are bringing in the market. And just kind of right. The well, and the way the market comes in is through Lori, who sits on that committee. So um, that's what her voice is critical in that, is in talking to the university relations managers, marketing, right, all the units that report to her, so that when we're thinking about, well, should we open a program in Turkey or, or, or should we close a program in Mali? Because it's not just developing new, it's 
it's retrenching too, that, that your um, input from the field gets up to us there. Um, and that's something that we've, I've tried to make a priority. I met with the university relations managers and I hope we'll do that every year um, so that the field, the vision from the field gets, gets up there. And that's, that's why Lori's um, voice has been important and why she's been on academic affairs too. Um, when, that was, when academic affairs was particularly involved in program development because the external conditions, the market, what people are saying out in the field is, is crucial. Um, it's great to have a great vision about something, but if nobody wants to go there, <laughs> not too helpful. So, um, th- yeah, that's why we, we definitely value um, the enrollment management areas, uh, thoughts and opinions on these things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think we went through kind of what are the academic deans responsible for and I talked a little bit about um, the types of things that they do and this may, may help. My vision is that generally the academic deans are responsible for their curricular revisions within the scope and mission of the existing program. So if they're going to tweak a course, they're going to um, you know, reassign some credit or they're going to update or refresh a course, they don't have to go back through academic affairs for that. It's when you need to do a complete sweeping overhaul, add a new course, or revamp the entire nature of a course. You know, it's not just that you're updating it, but now you're really going to change it completely to something else. Um, changes in course titles, course distribution, things like that come through them. Um, they should be making their changes in consultation with fellow deans, especially in places where it could affect other deans. So if we decide we're going to start um, doing things a different way in Asia, um, we should maybe talk to all the other deans and see if that makes sense, you know, so that it's not incoherent. There may be times when we need to do something in Asia differently than in MENA and study abroad, or the Grad Institute needs to do something a little different than we need to do in study abroad, but we should talk about it. And so I'm encouraging the deans, before they make their decisions, to come to the table and share. And we're doing that more and more. Um, anything that's major must be reviewed by Academic Affairs Committee. Um, I need to be informed about things, um, larger s- curriculum decisions, you know, well, for example, we've just, we've reallocated some of the credit in study abroad um, that was done with the previous provost, Lori worked, you know, with the provost on that. Um, change in the ISP process in study abroad would be an example that I'd want to look at and see what the team thinks. Um, changes in our language requirement for a whole program, a whole division, a whole degree, I'd want to know about that. Um, but that's primarily what, what they do. Skip this because grade appeals is kind of detailed. Um, Student evaluations I'll talk about um, are really, really, really important. And I'm trying to work with all of the deans to figure out how we can be more effective in getting the data to the, getting the surveys out to the students, getting the information back, making sure the deans look at it, and then finding ways to make it transparent so that other people who need to see it or want to see it can. And one of the ways that we've been doing it are through the assessment <coughs> dashboards, which are kind of summaries of the, um, the evaluations. And, um, and then the academic deans are going to be preparing action plans for each program. It's really important, and we'll have to figure out, Ellen, exactly how, because we do publish some of our data on the website. All of you are part of the academics team. If you happen to catch a comment and you think, gosh, that looks like there may be a problem, I wonder what's going on there, you need to feel comfortable, and you should, feel that it's your obligation even to raise that to your dean. Say, hey, you know, I, this looks a little weird. What was that? You know, or I've heard in the field, you know, URMs are really good. Because um, we want to know about those things. Sure, if something's a rumor that we hear out in the field, we're not going to go and jump on someone's case because of a rumor. But it, but it might mean that we need to look at that carefully and see, gosh, is it really true that this is happening on the field? Or that, you know, the homestays here weren't very good or uh, the courses in the grad school weren't organized. And we, we don't want to feel that that's not, it's not about accusing, it's not about, it's about collaborating and when we identify problems, making sure we talk about them openly and honestly. <coughs> Due process, we look and see, is there really something there? Maybe there's not. Um, but if there is, so the deans can correct it and fold it into an action plan. Um, we also want to figure out ways to make those action plans more transparent. We haven't gotten there yet. I don't know where, how we publish them or where we put them, but um, I, I think the teams need to know what we plan on doing in study abroad at, at a high level so that you're informed about how we're changing things. And in the past, I understand that's not always been something we've been effective at. And so. Um, in my view, the academic affairs group, all of those of us who are responsible for making decisions on the curriculum, need to be accountable um, 
not only to the institution and to its mission, but to our students. And that means sharing the information with all of you who interact, many of you, with students at, at diff in different ways. So you know what we're doing and what we're thinking. Um, so that's an area for improvement in my office and we're still, we're still working on it. Um, any comments on that from any of the folks that were here? Actually, going one slide back, um, would you talk a little bit about um, what the assistant provost role is oh, going okay. to be yeah. in Go back. connecting with the sort of the smaller level yeah. curricular changes, course title changes? One of the challenges that we've had that I think we've, we have improved <coughs> is in the communication, um, right. just within study abroad. Of, of approved changes and timings for them. Yeah. So is the assistant provost going to be involved in that? Yes. Yeah, so, so what's happening now is that if you look at it, I have kind of a lot of direct reports and I really like working with all of them, but I can't get everywhere I need to be and stuff slips through. So the idea of the assistant provost um, is that very much like the dean of the graduate school who's kind of a central figure, there are chairs who also support the dean of the grad school a similar kind of role, the assistant provost will supervise all of the academic deans, so Asia, Lace, Mina, right? And that is the person who should be responsible for, you know, communicating to everybody, hey, we're doing this, we're going here, we're going there, these are the programs we're going to have to close, this is, you know, these are the programs we're going to have to open. And so that should come from that, that person's office, right? Um, so that there's more clarity. I mean, if I can make a comment on that, and give an example. I mean, I think there were uh, there was a lot of progress made in the last several years of having um, more autonomy for the academic deans, and there were a lot of good things that were done. But I think there were some downsides to it as well, and I think we saw one of them in the curriculum revision that we did. Um, those of you who, who Wanda, and people in enrollment, I mean, we had some real challenges in rolling that out with the schools because I don't think we did it in as coordinated a way as possible. And I, would, I wish we could rewind the clock and do that curriculum revision with an assistant provost in place so I think we could make sure that we were all on the same page and that we were moving forward on a timeline and that we stuck to the time that that was going to happen. I think we would have had a lot less confusion um, <coughs> and, and a better rollout of it. I think people agreed that it was a good idea, but the rollout of it was very clunky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I want to be clear about this. It isn't that by centralizing things that I want to be making all the decisions, but by bringing them all together, because I convene the table, right, um, we'll be better able to make decisions that um, are positive for the whole organization. And I think that that's the idea. The deans still have a lot of responsibility and, and autonomy, but but we need to bring them to the table so we're more informed. And I think Lori's right. Some of the challenges with the previous way things were organized is that, you know, there can be a lot of inconsistency. I mean, we're all different people and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you've got completely separate deans working with separate sets of agendas, um, it could be that someone has a really good idea someone else doesn't see um, or someone else missed a memo and so you get an imbalance, right, in, in various places. And we've seen that and I think that's what we're trying to correct. I'll give you a really concrete example, um, too, in, in full transparency. If you look at, you know, I, I care about the margins, how much, you know, we're, we're earning in each study abroad program, but it isn't just that, oh, your margin's 2% and your margin's 40%, so 40% is good, 2% is bad, you're bad, you're good. It's not that simple. When you see margins that are really, really high, and some of our <coughs> Africa programs were turning back high margins, but before Tina got in, there wasn't as much investment in Africa, and so some of our program sites don't look very good. Um, so we want Africa to be contributing, right? That's a good thing. But if you look at Latin America, which has similar economic issues, some um, currencies that are undervalued, so on and so forth, their margins were down in the 25s, 30s, which is, based on my knowledge of study, about pretty good. And if you look at their program sites, their infrastructure and the investment, it was pretty good. And there was this real imbalance, right? And that happened, again, not talking about the previous deans, but they had to do, you know, they had to manage with their own separate set of criteria. And by bringing it all together, I can catch that and say, whoa, wait a minute, you know, I think, I think you need to invest a little bit more, actually. This is the case where you need to spend more money because the program infrastructure needs support, right? Um, and if I see a region that's really, really low, I can say, whoa, we need to do something to work with marketing to try to get your, your numbers up. 
right? And that can only happen if we bring it all together at the same table. I think that's, that would be an example of where I, I saw greater collaboration could, could be more effective. Um, also, when the deans are sharing their reports with one another, you can really get a sense of, oh, how do I stack up with the others? Are, are, we, are we balanced? Because we want a really balanced portfolio of high quality everywhere. And, um, and that's what kind of bringing things together is designed to do. I would give one more example of where I think it could be useful. Um, we have noticed lately that there's kind of this proliferation of usage of things like community service and internship and practicum. And we everyone has, seems to have their own idea of what that is and it raises a lot of questions from the outside so you know I, there's occasional conversations about that but it doesn't necessarily come to a conclusion I think an assistant mm -hmm. provost could facilitate that conversation so that we all get on the same page about that and we're not we're not confusing people with our use of these terms which can have various definitions but we need to have an institutional definition of what that is yeah okay good um, the action plans well uh, we don't need to go into detail, but, but um, Latin America actually had designed one and we've kind of based the action plans off of Latin America um, you know, where they look at strength and weaknesses of each component and that's kind of what they've been looking like. Um, we'll skip the register. That's fine. You can skip the registrar's office. Skip professional development, some administration stuff. Skip that. Talk a little bit about community, because those are detailed things. If you want to talk about the registrar, we can talk about the registrar's office. But um, when we were doing this, I had a different group of folks in the room. Communication and collaboration. Um, I think that's some of the things that I, I'm hoping we can do. Um, here's where I'll talk about something I didn't talk about in the reset meeting, which is I know you've seen Lori and Michael walking around all the units and we're moving around and people, you know, what's going on with the offices. Well, the objectives with that is when you walk around Bliss House, it's kind of crowded. We've got new people coming in. We've got some of the Africa people here, working with people here. It, it's a little mixed up. So the idea is to, and I had Lori and Michael really do this. I, I really can claim no credit for the brilliant master plan that they're rolling out. Um, but I think it is good. Is First of all, we need to get functional work groups together so people can have the collaboration. So that's the idea. Um, we need to allocate space. There's not a lot of it. So we need to try to make it... Um, as effective and, and useful as possible. The offices that are a little bigger or have meeting space need to go to folks who meet with people, right? Um, or folks who need quiet, so people who are on the phone or doing tasks that require you to be concentrating. We want to try to make sure that there's a quiet space for that. Um, repair some of the cubicles so that they're a little bit better and more soundproof. Clean up some of the kitchen and stuff because we want you to have a positive work environment. There's a lot of clutter and files and stuff. I'm sure you'll be happy to know there's a room now um, next door to uh, the Michael Swal Smallest Suite. <laughs> yes. In the inner hall where I stay, there's an empty room next to it. So we, we are going to make that our files or storage room. Yeah. So we'll be coordinating that. I'll be working with a few of you. So you get to see a lot of old junk go out of Bliss House, which should give you cleaner, more open aisles. We'll do a little painting, the areas that haven't been painted so far and carpeted, um, and reorganize that a little bit so that we have the work groups a little bit more functional, so that the assistant provost and the folks that work with her or him will be together, um, the different regions will be together, custom and comparative will be together, so there's a little bit more... Um, um, clarity and consistency. Some of the other moves on campus, um, one of the principles has been that, that the um, units that work more closely with students need to be in the central part of campus and that's been tough because some people have had to move. We, we moved EIL to Upton because we really need the central space the EIL students are, are very rarely here, you know, and so, but our um, career and practicum students from, from the grad school are, you know, all the time. And we really needed to have that central space that's ADA um, accessible, right, um, available for them. So that's why the career and practicum services is going in, in Roach um, <coughs> and why EIL is going to Upton. Um, we also wanted to move the student affairs team you know, Bliss is tight and um, Student Affairs works closely with Study Abroad but a lot of their team <coughs> spot for one another even those who don't work with the grad school spot for one another and so we wanted to put them all together in the central so what used to be the Apple building what used to be the health center is now going to be Student Affairs too <coughs> excuse me so um, you guys are getting brand new space yes and it's, it's nice because that building sat dormant for a whole year <laughs> It's great use of space utilization, and um, I'm excited. We're going to miss all of you, but you know, 
I do realize for us to walk up the hill or down the hill or you, it's not a big deal. Sometimes for students it is. So, yeah. oh, I got to go see the dean of students up the hill. And, you know, they could see Stephen or other folks. But it's been a hindrance. And what's nice is it puts all of our team together. So we're going to miss all of you, but we're just... You know, yeah. 200 feet away. So what you all have to do in our nicely reorganized, very beautiful El Cafe, which is a lovely space, go down and have a Mocha Joe's with, with your colleagues from other departments. Um, yeah, I have to get work groups intact together, but I hope that what you can find ways of doing is also collaborating outside of your work group. Um, and so do that. Or organize your own lunch with people. Come together in the cafeteria or have a staff meeting, you know, over ice cream somewhere. I don't know. You know, all these things. Uh, can I just add, mm -hmm. with the renovations and, and relocations and bliss, we'll be a little more forthcoming. You've seen us walking around. We don't want anybody to get paranoid. One thing that I always loved when I was with our with the professional staff senate at my old school, that's your surroundings. That's your home for... 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and we want to try to make that as comfortable as possible. It's a little difficult when you're in, a, I guess, an 18th century farmhouse. It doesn't always lend itself for that, you know, to make that happen. So we are trying to create user groups, folks who work together, collaborate more so, whether by region or department, that's one thing. We're trying to look at areas that haven't been paved in a while or carpeted. We're looking at broken furniture. We're looking at making that building work and still keeping it the bliss house that it's always been, that energy, that vibrant mm -hmm. place, but really updating it and making it more functional. Where that might become a problem for some is, I think when we look at space, and it, this might sound a little blunt, but I guess I want, you're assigned to space, and I know we get territorial, okay? We have to look at the function of the job, not necessarily the person who is holding that job, okay? So please know if you get moved or shifted or whatever, nothing was personal. We're looking at functionality of that role and how you interact with students, with other folks, people on the phone, and making it a really great environment. And what's been great is Tracy and John Banowski and Gary and all them have been very instrumental. We're going to be utilizing space we've never, you know, we're opening things up. We're trying to, you know, create office space where there was like this big open corral and people can't hear. So we're creating spaces. So yeah, we are actually building nice. some walls up too to create some more quiet spaces. And so it's, I, I'll let them roll out the details because you know it better than I do. Um, but it was driven by, not by me coming in, because I don't know the units that well, but by Lori and, and Michael who really know. The, the, the folks that work there best and most of them report to one or the other of you or many of them do um, and Tina was involved too in helping look at this as well so we kind of had all these different visions of, of that and I, I think what we're going to get is a really <coughs> better place for you um, that's one of those places where those principles I talked about may seem contradictory I'm willing to spend some money there uh, yes I am controlling our costs but on the other hand you know I want everyone to feel like they are comfortable, that they can work well together, that their morale is, is better. And so even if there's a little transition that's tough, you're going to end up with better spaces and a cleaner, more open environment. And, and it's designed to make that better, you know, more effective for you. Um, and, and so sometimes quality means you have to spend a little bit of money. And, and, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing. So Michael and Lori are looking at, at that. And um, they're kind of our space gurus, I so think. We're trying to, the way we're trying to do it also is getting more people to interact on different floors. If, let's be honest, I mean, you, you, we hear the garden level, that's admissions. But, you know, you, you have little, we all have little stereotypes of areas of the building. What we're trying to do with this move is get people to cross and look and watch. Like John was saying, when we come to a meeting, we tend to sit in our groups. What we want to do here is get people walking through, circulating through the building, mm -hmm. utilizing it. Where what something may have been for 20 years, it might get moved because it's more functional that way. It also gets folks more around the building instead of staying in your one area. Yeah. And it's always good to redecorate, right, once in a while? And yes. kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be... Well, and the reality is that, you know, some of the positions that have not been based in Vermont are coming back to Vermont. Yeah. That's and true. that has been yeah. part of the impetus for this. Oh, I should talk about that, why I'm bringing the deans back. Um, so, I, I, I'm not a Luddite. I know that, that you can work with Skype, and I do all the time, and I'm connected to my iPhone and my iPad and my, my iLife. 
um, just like everybody else is. So it can work to have people all over the world, but it, you look at it, when I come into an organization and think about leadership, you think, well, what are the challenges that this organization has in this place at this time? And one of them has been how to communicate more effectively, how to collaborate more effectively, and how to get our systems and processes to work. I mean, I sound about right? And if those are your challenges, then um, the solution doesn't seem to me to have more people based all over. So people are coming back and are more available. And that's not everybody all the time, but we're getting more and more people relocated here more often, at least. And what that does is it just creates more options, you know, more avenues for people to talk to one another and work together. And so you'll see Saeed more often than you're used to. Um, because he'll be coming in for large chunks of time and, and you'll see some of the other dean, noop dean positions coming back and um, you know student affairs in a central part of campus and so when Michael's here you'll see him more um, or folks that are on campus will have the option to see him as well because he'll be right in the center hub. So the vision of that is to try to help address what the organization has told me are some, and I perceive to be true, some of our challenges. Um, Creativity isn't our challenge. Academic quality isn't our challenge, right? Um, those are good strengths to have. Um, our challenges have been more operational, so we we'll, we'll want to work on those by trying to get groups together and get people working together and by bringing people on campus. Um, that was more for us. That's kind of the end. I think I'll end there and we can talk. <laughs> Questions, comments? I don't bite. <laughs> Not usually. Anyone? There's your chance, people. Come on. <laughs> you. One thing you didn't address, John, is mm -hmm. price point. And mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate the academic quality and mm -hmm. all that's very important to my job, but so is the price point. And I appreciate also that we have now extended the Pell Grant to all programs, but I think keeping things reasonable and having more scholarships available is really mm -hmm. important. Price point is, is a huge issue. Um, in fact, Lori is working among Nancy as well in finance, right? We're trying to be a little more strategic in pricing. Um, and we saw, to be honest, haven't figured out exactly our system, but we got a draft of it um, to where we, we sort of try to bring the information together. Before, I think that was another case where all the different units were pricing a little bit differently. And the grad was a real good example of that. And Lori, feel free to jump in when I'm wrong. She shudders, <laughs> but, you know, I don't think anyone who works with grad would disagree that the prices were all over the shop, right? And we've tried to be more strategic in bringing together. I'll give another example in study abroad where I do think we have room to fix things. Um, when I look at the summer price point, it's way too high. So um, if it costs that much really to do the programs there, then maybe we need to do the program somewhere else. Um, or we need to tinker with the content or something because that, that feels way out of the market in many cases. Um, now, there are some accounting reasons that might lead you down that path. Um, so Sally and those of you who know about accounting, if you're doing allocating the cost, we call it full cost allocation, if you're allocating the entire cost of the whole organization equitably by student across every program including summer, it's going to look like they have to carry more weight. But if you think about it differently and you say, well, summer is actually just added income, it's using resources we already have because we have our space there, we don't necessarily need to make the same margin on it as we do elsewhere it can lead you to analyze things differently. Accounting is, is not just a science, it's an art, right? And so is budgeting. So I think that part of the answer to your question is not just um, giving more scholarships, it's more strategically allocating our scholarships towards the kind of goals that we want and making our price point fit the markets that we serve. Um, and in some cases, yes, we may need to raise prices, some we may need to lower them, you know. Um, and in some cases with scholarships, we need to just reallocate a little bit. Lori's ideas, I think, were, were really good. By doing the Pell Grant and then the Pell Match, what we're saying that's different than other study abroad is that need-based aid, so enabling the study abroad experience for folks who have a financial need is something that we value. It's also saying something else, which is, I think, I, I think it's true, maybe it's controversial, but I think it's true. We also have a value about diversity. We also know that one of the best ways to increase diversity is to increase access, because a lot of the reasons why we don't have as diverse a group in study abroad is affordability. And so by saying Pell Grant Match, and correct me if I got your strategy wrong, but I 
they think of articulating it, right? Is by saying we care about financial need and we think that will increase our diversity. So we're going to do Pell Grant and we're going to match that. Um, the Big Ten, quite frankly, we, Lori has rolled out some scholarships for the Big Ten that increases the value for the Big Ten. The Big Ten are large public institutions which are broadening our reach, right? Because you have a large group of students. They come from a very diverse range geographically and they're big student bodies and more diverse student bodies than a lot of the small liberal arts colleges. So that's an area where we target. Um, and then specific partnerships like Bonner, you know, um, that we've worked with, you know, are uh, ways of addressing our goals, which are to, I think, make more um, affordability and more access. Um, but you're absolutely right. We've tried to, we are in some markets, I think, you know, mid-high, which is okay, and in some we're, we're way at the top. So when we go back and look at it strategically for study abroad, I think in the same way that Lori already did with a team in grad, I think we're going to come up with something a little more coherent. That's a long answer. <laughs> that, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your vision for, for where growth will come in uh, study abroad. Uh, you talked about slowing down, mm -hmm. not, not new programs. So clearly yeah. it's going to come from there. Um, where, do you, where do you see it? Yeah, I think it's going to be an open, there's a lot moving around. Um, so the good and the bad. One thing that's true is that the fact that we're doing pretty well, and, and we are, by being more strategic and <coughs> cost control and so forth. Um, our numbers are, it's tough. I know every student that we, that we earn is, is hard won and all of you who are responsible for helping with that do fantastic work. Um, but our numbers haven't, haven't slid tremendously. So that means there is still a market out there and you all are working harder and harder to get it. I, I, I'm aware of that. Particularly some of you that are out in the field are working really hard on that. Um, but there is still a market there. So I think part of it is going to be, quite frankly, um, by, by not only, um, it's not building new programs, it's maybe realigning. So if we close some programs in one place, we need to open a couple in another place. So I think that's one area, figuring out where the market actually is. Um, I actually think that we're a little ahead of the game and I think the undergraduate research is going to be strong and I think we're well poised because we've been doing that for a long time. But you're seeing research offices start to, fun to work more with um, study abroad offices and students are doing more off-campus research projects. That's a clear deliverable. Students want to know what did I get from the experience. It's not enough to say it was a great experience, it changed my life. I mean that's great but if I'm an employer what do I care? I want to know what can you do, you know? I want to know what you can do and if you say well I went to and I did a research project on water quality in Uganda, in Uganda or Rwanda, I can speak with local people, I can create a project plan and, and here's my research by the way, I presented it at Notre Dame at a conference. That's useful. So some of the growth will come by articulating better what the value is. I think we're getting better at that. Um, aligning our programs with the places students want to be. We're starting to do that. I mean, I think the critical global issues positioning has been great for us. Global health is an area. So if we can continue to respond to those things, I think we'll capture some market share. I don't want to be too competitive, but we'll capture some market share from other providers. Hey, you know, we have to do that too, um, in a nice way, <laughs> with a smile on our face. Um, but I think that it, it, those are some of the things that will help us. Custom and comparative, maybe, but a caution there. I've watched another organization I worked with say, the way we're going to do custom is throw everything at the board and see what sticks. And it was incredibly expensive and a lot of effort, and they didn't get a lot for it. So I think we need to be strategic with that one. Do you want to mm -hmm. mention, maybe it's premature, the we can talk a little bit about, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that broadly. I'm, one of the things I'm thinking, and we've talked about this in, in the dean's meetings, and we have to figure out how to, how to really, it's green right now, but uh, refocusing summer primarily on the science, technology, and professions, which we already have strength in with health, but there are others we can do. Nepal geology is coming on board, earth sciences generally. I think that STEM students we know is an area for growth. We know that they can't necessarily go during the year. It's tough. So we're kind of playing around the edges with could we sort of really start focusing summer on STEM and the professions, um, healthcare business, so on. And I think that may be one way to try to boost market share is to create a new market. Um, everyone talks about it. No one's done it effectively. There are a couple of good engineering programs out there. Um, DIS has things. You know, we know IES has an engineering program in Madrid. CIE has something in Sweden, I think. Um, but it's not big yet. And so I think we have some opportunity, particularly because we're good at things that the STEM and professions want. They want um, concrete, research-based, action-based types of things, and, and we're, we do that well, so, yeah. Um, I wanted to know how, what, what 
was talking about um, using um, the resources that we already have um, within the different countries and also within Vermont. Um, how, what, like, what's your vision on how we can use those different partnerships that we have? Like, say, we, you know, we have EIL mm -hmm. in uh, lots of different countries, and we also have study abroad in different countries, and we also have IDP in lots of different countries. But sometimes those entities, at least in the past few years, they don't even know that they exist, or they don't <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so, what is your necessarily your vision for bringing those together, and also helping to change attitudes for different departments that have been so much like I'm EIL, I'm together, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's like you, you hit on a lot of things there. Um, this is going to be one of the hardest things to do. I'll be honest. Um, because they're so back when they were being set up, sometimes the legal entities. I don't want to get too detailed here, but there are cases where the legal entity, when you set up a legal entity, you have to dis dis define what you do and what kind of legal entity you are depends on what you do. And say IDEP, for example. We're an NGO that, that does health work around HIV AIDS in Ethiopia. Great, fine, perfect. Now we come in and we say we want to do education and it's like we got to fix that because our legal, we're legally authorized to do one thing and we want to do another thing. So I, what I'm saying is there are some barriers to collaboration. What we're doing, we meet, the Global Ops Group is starting to meet more regularly. So that's the law, the legal counsel's office and some of us who work abroad at VCAS who works on compliance, some of the deans and we've literally made a grid of where do we exist as IDEP, where do we exist as SIT, where do we exist and we're starting out to just map the landscape um, and there are places where it's literally there are three offices of some sort. I mean, maybe the office is a person, but there are you know, three entities. And slowly trying to see if where we can use one entity. Where can we get to one? Um, it's easier in a new place. So if we open a new place, a new, um, we've had some challenges right now in Egypt. We're not fully there in study abroad, but we've been talking. We want to create a legal entity with the legal office that will allow us to be an educational institution and an NGO. And can we do that? So we're starting up front with new places and with the older places we've got to just place by place by place by place go country by country. The other thing quite frankly is helping to change what you said, attitudes. Um, you know a lot of places have small offices and if you say to someone you know there's maybe a say let's say study abroad dir uh, academic director and an assistant now you're going to have responsibility for helping process legal you know accounting for 600 other students or for 30 other students they push back a little bit. So we have to figure out how to um, make sure they have the resources they need. You know, I think it's just going to take a long time of relationship building, talking it through, going through and making legal changes, you know, country by country, region by region, until we get around. IHP is a good example. There are now some places where IHP contracts um, their staff through the uh, study abroad offices now, the, in the International Honors Programs do that and that's that's working. We have a big meeting this week, I think four or five hours to look at um, IHP and its structure and how precisely those kinds of things. How does that work on the ground? Um, so I, I th that's maybe more detail than you wanted but I think it's slow and painstaking. It's, it it sure. will take and time. Like, um, is there some kind of communication system in place to like let um, maybe folks working here or folks in different departments know about all of our different entities in different countries? Because I think that sometimes what happens is from like the like the coordinator um, standpoint, like we don't even know about the other possibilities that hmm. are there. That's a good point. I hadn't even. So just the communication yeah. of that would be. Important. Should talk to Lisa and see if that matrix could be. Remember, didn't we do a ma there was that matrix in that last meeting? Remember where it had like the. Oh, you Ellen, weren't. Ellen, Ellen was in Global Ops. Were you in Global Ops? Well, yeah, I think we could share that matrix with you. Yeah. up to a very large world learning map. But there's no reason why that couldn't roll back down into something more detailed. Yeah. It might be something that would be a good place, um, a good repository um, to uh, use in an internet for. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, I might ask you kind of, but to what end? Like, I mean, can you be specific? Because I always feel like everybody's saying, oh, we need to communicate more, we need to communicate more. But then I'm like, I personally, I was just, you know, I'd say this quite a bit, but I, I don't want to be copied on everything. Like, mm -hmm. I also don't want to know, how I feel like, and we're everywhere, and now I have to be involved in everything. Yeah. <laughs> but sure, I guess it's my fear of oversharing. Yeah. 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 I guess it's like, 
for me, what happened, like, I, I originally came into the organization through HR, and so I knew a lot of, about the organization as a whole, and I started to study abroad. Um, and so when I so when I got there, um, it was just, so I was saying, well, we have, um, like with the example of, of say, Ecuador, and where we do, the study abroad offices are in the experiment offices, and so they kind of do work together. Um, but just I think it's, it's helpful to know the different resources that are available because also through like now we have youth like youth programs through our Washington DC offices that have pro that we're doing a youth ambassadors program in Chile and in in Peru and <coughs> like through that I was it we were able to do some hi hiring using the study abroad offices so just I guess to know that there's also like different support within the yeah yeah country that we're working I think the idea and is well, yeah, I mean, but you have a different perspective. Like I would never need to know any of that. Yeah. Like so, I just wanted to know what perspective you were coming from there. Cause I'm like, I think I the idea is making. I think that the idea is making the information more available yeah. and easier to find, so that people who do need it can find it. And it's going to take us a while because IT is working on a better SharePoint site, and I've given them some things to line up. And Shauna helped me with this, and, but it's going to take them a while to get it built. But when it's built. There'll be one place where you can go and get kind of a new walkabout. That's coming. Yeah, we're um, working on a new intranet that okay. should provide sort of a high level access to things like that. And also access to things that ev everyone needs to know. Um, like if they're going to travel, you need a travel authorization, you need policies and procedures. You may not know what department to go to or what person to go to, they need to be in a central place. But it connects in because it's in the SharePoint system. It connects into the Academic Affairs SharePoint site that would be available to everyone who works in study abroad, or at least a portion would, so that you would be able to dig into that deeper level of information if you wanted. Okay. For example, like I think Susan, I think it, I think it was Susan Bardoon in the Graduate Institute was meeting, like she, they were working with some graduate students and were working on taking them to a prop, like to a site visit or project, doing you know, a project mm -hmm. somewhere, and one project fell through, but then. I happened to be just in conversation talking with her and, and mentioned that we were closing the, the Mexico program. And she's like, oh, I bet they have homes, like they have homestays, like they have homestay connections there. And she's like, well, we were thinking of going to Mexico. And so we, knowing that we did have a right. program in Mexico, I was able to hook her up with the AD there and mm -hmm. they were able to find homestays for the graduate students that were there. So yeah. it's just like, it's helpful, I feel like, to know that there's these different to know what's going on. It's, it's also helpful for, I mean, where I sit and trying to recruit international students, that we have these offices all over, and if we could get some of those people to, you know, recruit some international students to the Graduate Institute, it would be wonderful. You know, trying to help graduate admissions with that is, you know, it's, it's a road. Yeah. Well, and some of it is just knowing what's on our website. I mean, yeah. all of our programs are on our website. It's just taking the time you gotta to go Yeah, there. and I know the website's uh, going to be looked at. <laughs> Over time. <laughs> a, a well, it was along the same lines. It's just how we're going to disseminate information because we have all these committees, people meeting, you know, deans. But how do, how are we going to let other people who are not of these committees know what's going on? Because it really helps if you have a general idea within study abroad, for example, of what the other sections are doing. Because mm -hmm. we right. all work towards the same goal. So knowing what's going on, you don't feel like you're working in such a vacuum. Anymore, yeah, I, and I, th I think a lot of this will get better when we get the SharePoint up because then it, the problem right now is where is information? I have that same problem. I share it with you. Just because I sit in the profile doesn't mean I can easily find the information I need either. I mean, it may be on the server or the web or a combination or I have to call Shauna cause she, or, or Kim because they know how to pull the information and I don't or you know, that kind of thing. Um, so because of that, I think you're right. One of our weaknesses is, a, is systems and processes aren't quite there yet. So hopefully working on the web and working on the, um, a SharePoint site will be ways of helping that. Actually, uh -huh. I don't know, I'm just curious to know how people feel about, you know, staff meetings. Because we used to have study abroad meetings where all the different part, um, sections would come together and you would know what, you know, the African region is doing, what mm -hmm. university is doing, and I don't know if people... No, like that would be interesting back from site visits. Like right. Like presentations to, like, all of the yeah. I know we all had a lot of meetings. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, and I think that's good, and that's part of the role of the assistant provost. I would be open to doing it, but I get my time gets carved up in 20-minute blocks sometimes, and so the only reason I haven't isn't because it's not something I value. It's because I can't. I can barely get out of my desk, you know, and up to come to something like this once in a while. But I do. My expectation is the study abroad 
um, assistant provost would be able to do that more because I'll be kind of duplicating my time and then that person could, could do that in the same way that the dean of the grad school has an all-faculty assembly or things like that. For the, we could have an all-study abroad assembly and I, I think that's good. I've also asked the deans, the regionally focused academic deans, right? So, um, you know, LACE, Asia, MENA, right? Latin America, to have regional meetings again and make sure that the minutes of those get, get done um, every month. And that would mean the regional study abroad people and somebody from student affairs, somebody from enrollment management, so that there's kind of more sharing and then that those things get, get put up, ideally in a SharePoint where they're, they're public. But that's going to take a little while to roll out. Uh -huh. As much as I hear you keep saying SharePoint, I would just hope that you, as you bring in new deans, reiterate to them how important it is for them to communicate with their staff on a regular yeah. basis. Some of us have the luxury of having very communicative, feeling like they have very communicative chains of command up and down and yeah. but then if you have if somebody if one of those links gets removed because they haven't been you know they've been field based or haven't had the same commitment to making sure that they pass mm -hmm. information along, you get other people feeling like left out of the loop and then they go find out the information the wrong way and it's not necessarily the correct or it's or if it is correct it's not delivered the way that it should right, have been. Right, right. Um, and so I mean I yeah. definitely feel that in the city of Barbara we've had people remote and and having other reports here in Brattleboro, and mm -hmm. we haven't, I felt like the communication hasn't been as good as when everything has been here. Not that it has to be here, but just that the, the culture of like, we need you to be a good communicator needs to be something. Yeah, that's and that's something with the deans that I've, uh, the, the academic deans that are being hired now for study abroad. Um, is being said in the interviews. You know, I'm looking for people who um, can be good communicators internally and externally, quite frankly. Institutional relations should be a part of their job too. Um, they won't travel like the recruiters do, but they should support the recruiters and go and, and open doors to academic departments, for example. Um, and then they need to be good internal communicators. And that, that hasn't always been something we've prioritized in the job description. And I think we do have some folks who do a good job of it, um, but something we are going to do going forward, yeah. Um, I think it would be helpful, um, Michael and I were talking about this earlier, when, you know, we are getting a fair number of new people at, at the, the dean's sort of level, I think it will be helpful to review or re-clarify where the areas, are, who has what area of responsibility, because I think it has been unclear sometimes with, um, like, new programs and things, you know, I assume that people who are on that team know about it, but that is not always the case, and so I think we need to just review some of those things to clarify the the communication lines and as John has said there's much more communi cross communication now with the Dean's group more than there has been for the last several years I think um, but we do have to review that I think there are some gray areas between you know who's responsible for what communication that crosses over between the academic area between Michael's area my area Ellen's yeah. it'll be good, it'll be a good opportunity to review that because we have some yeah. I think we do still have work to do yeah and I, John that was what I when I was saying that when you sat down reset I meant the internal reset and study yeah. abroad because as the coast had mentioned and a few others I think that if you've been here for quite some time you were used to certain information being shared and I think some of that has dropped off I guess as, as the Dean of Students and Lori for Dean Enrollment and Ellen for Dean for Assessment we all have our direct reports and trickle mm -hmm. down, and I would hope that we're doing that. I try to go back and inform my staff of what I can inform. I mean, mm -hmm. naturally confidential and things that aren't out there. I can't do that, but I try to do that. And I think we've lost that in, in, yeah, in the yeah. last part. And I think a lot of people are just, not that everybody has to know every single thing. I think people are just feeling left yeah. out or would like to be able to make decisions when they get a call and not have to pass it around if they had that information, I guess. Yeah, I think that's, and I think that's a good reason for bringing that role back of someone coordinating all the study abroad because um, all, I mean, you actually gave, gave me a really good justification that I, you know, for that position, which is that it helps bring you all together more often, and and should happen, because um, that's if that's done, then I, then it's easier even for you to have access to me, because I can simply with the grad, I just say I'm going to come to the faculty assembly. Tell me when it is, and I'll come every every month for 30 minutes. I can come to your meeting, you know, because someone else is convening it and doing it regularly. Then you you get access to the decision makers more because that's happening regularly. So yeah, and I'm hoping that when we get the assistant provost position hired, and we're taking our time and finding the right person 
to do a lot of these things. They've got to be a good communicator. They've got to be good at convening people. They have to be sharp with money. You know, they, we want a lot. So, um, so hopefully when that gets filled, one of the things they'll do is have more staff meetings, more regular staff meetings. I, and I will be happy to come too. So, mm -hmm. Anything else? Good. Was this helpful to kind of get a sense? Did, um, good. Any lingering questions? Uh, happy to do this again. Um, and, and again, hopefully as the uh, new positions come on board, we'll be training them in this new kind of more collaborative vision that we have. So new folks coming on board will start to um, help move the ball in the same direction. So thank you all for all the work you do. Um, that's the most important thing I can just say. I'm sorry, one mm -hmm. last thing. The moves, just because with Lori and I here, we're trying to finalize everything and we haven't announced everything because we don't want to get everybody's blood pressure up. <laughs> okay, and I'd rather you know what's going to happen and then speculate. We all know how we can kind of jump on something. Um, but we're trying to finalize with John Manowski in the next week or so. But what I wanted to let you know is that it's going to be a series of things. It's kind of a domino effect. Once my team moves out, that frees them up to go and paint and carpet and do things. And we're on a real tight, tight timetable. But there's going to be some parts that they're going to move, but they're probably not going to move until over the holiday. Not Thanksgiving, I mean, this is going to be probably for the next six to eight weeks till we get everybody in place. So I know my team is the first to move. We're moving on November, the tentative date is November 12th, and it's actually just a day. We'll be gone, and in a minute we're out, and they may even start before. They're going to start the carpeting and everything. So just so you know, <laughs> well, John has three paint swatches on his wall. I know, I, even I get paint. I get, even I get paint. So <laughs> good. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you.